Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Liam the Prove It Guy, author of Limitation is a Mirage. In this podcast, I will be sharing with you actionable tips, routines and insights that I have gathered over 20 years of extensive study with masters, experts and world-class performers. My hope with this podcast is to save you time, money and frustration, helping you fast track your way to mastery. Hey guys, welcome to this bonus episode of the Limitation is a Mirage podcast. In this podcast, I speak with Tom Lamont from the Chumsuck Fighting Academy. I've studied with Tom for about 14 years. When I first started, I just wanted to learn Wing Chun. And then I realized that he was actually a true martial artist. So there's a difference between a martial artist and someone that does martial arts. And we go into that in the podcast. So we also delve into his training, how he got the way he is within his martial arts, why he trains the way he trains, how he trains the way he trains, the way he deals with his students and what he tries to what he tries to bring out of them. Hey guys, welcome to this bonus episode of the Limitation is a Mirage podcast. I'm here with Thomas Lamont or Tom Lamont, depending on how long you've known him, I guess. Uh, he has been a mentor and coach of mine for, I think it's about 14, 15 years, maybe, maybe even longer. I'm not, I should have thought about this beforehand, but um, we started off, you started showing me Wing Chun at the start. I didn't actually know what I was going up to learn at all. I just wanted to go on. I heard that this guy was good at martial arts <laughs> and I went up to find out like what I could learn. But once I got there, I discovered that it was more about martial arts. Like your background was incredible. Like you, I was trying to say this before the interview, catch his can. I think I got it right that time. You had that and then Valley Tudo and you'd been to Brazil and you had just done some incredible things, but it was your philosophy about the martial art that really personally is what really drew me into it. Um, So that's something I really, I kind of wanted to touch on, but um, with you, so were you always like that when you started training? Were you a martial artist or did you, like I know when I started, I just wanted to be able to kick ass and then I realized that's not what it's about at all. Um, So did you transition or did you, what way did you start it? Um, No, I think, like uh, all young guns when they come out at the start we all want to be able to kick ass and do what we're doing so i think there's a like a rites of passage that you go through and you earn your stripes and then you realize there's more to this you know than just punching and kicking and stuff it's been said before i mean bruce lee said it you know like uh, allegedly he's been quoted that uh, after 20 years he learned some the punch is a punch and a kick's a kick yeah. and that, there's a lot more to it than what he actually meant. So, um, but I was always a thinker. So um, I, I like, you know, to know why I'm doing something. So yeah. very, quick, very, very quickly for me, the, the why was the theory and the what was the practical. And that has stood me the test of time. You know, I always, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? I, I used to really annoy some of my old coaches you know, like a member in particular in Taekwondo, why are we doing this pattern? You need that pattern for your next belt. Oh, that's not what I mean. I mean, why are we actually doing this pattern? I just told you, do you know what it is? It doesn't matter. Okay. But then later on, you know, I decided, right, if I'm going to learn a pattern of movements or even a movement, I want to know in depth about it. So for me, I started off scratching the surface, mm-hmm. like what I found. And then I bought a spade and I started digging. And these days I'm a JCB and I'm digging down there and goodness knows what I'll find. But um, my students think I'm building my cave that I keep threatening to go to, but um, <laughs> they're not they're not best place that I'm going this cave. But hey, oh, so that that was for me, no. So it wasn't right off the bat. I think for me I had to prove to myself, not to anybody else, to myself that I could actually fight um, and handle myself if need be. And then very quickly, I realized why I was doing it. Um, there's a very deep philosophical, spiritual path with the martial arts, which mm-hmm. I don't know what I've been into. And, and I lost on that very quickly. Um, but I mean, who wants to listen to that, you know, <laughs> when you're teaching? Um, but as I say, no, it was a, more of a rites of passage for me, Liam, yeah. That, just when you're saying who wanted to listen to that, that was, I remember my first lesson, I actually couldn't drive at the time, so I got someone to convince someone to drive me up the road. So I drove up for up the road just over an hour. And I had been learning Wing Chun, learning on 
through a book in a wooden dummy by myself, just battering this wooden dummy, and love kung fu movies and like the whole idea of the. I loved all the old school ones where they had like like the medicine men that were healing, but they would like the Robin Hood type version. And then in the first lesson, there was about two or three wee nuggets that creep through where I was like, this guy, it's not just about the fight. There's something, I didn't know what I was listening to, if that makes sense, in between your terrible, jo- t- not terrible jokes. Those are terrible. Like, they were like daddy jokes before you were old enough to be saying daddy jokes. Well, um, well they've, they've actually progressed now because they're, they're the same jokes, but they're grander jokes now. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what happens with age, you see. That was one of the things I loved about the session too. You might go through something like that was mentally and physically tough. Like we'd learn a new um, pattern or, or whatever it was we were learning. And then all of a sudden the whole room would shift because you would tell a ridiculous joke. And it would bring everybody that was feeling overwhelmed back down to like, you're actually a human and not some sort of Wing Chun-esque robot which I think people miss when they go to martial arts. I've been to many different clubs and it was very regimented. It was like they took the martial aspect and forgot about, like you said, the other, there's more than just the fighting. There's the, the, phys, the, there is the physical, but there's the mental. And then of course the spiritual as well, which is why I've, I've only done 20 years, but it's why I've stuck at it and I've practiced no matter where I am or what I'm doing. Um, do you think that's why people are able to connect with you more because you your understanding is more than just martial, it's everything? I, I'm a great, believer, a great believer in like attracts like. So, um, you know, if you're the, if you want to be a fighter, then every single training session that you do should take you towards that goal. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to be the best grappler in the world, then every session should be taking you towards that goal. Um, but for me, it's more about the martial art, and I think there's a misunderstanding, and that's why I said you better write the passage. It's martial art, so martial comes first. That's why I said, yeah, I want to learn how to fight first. Mm-hmm. The art side of it, okay, um, is a bit more to it than that. Okay, so um, when you get a coach who knows what they're doing, and they say to you, this is quite simple, we do you show you, you can rest assured it's going to be the most complicated thing that you have tried to do in your entire life. But the coach you yeah. be looks so damn simple. It's like, you understand that? Yes, Sifu. Show me. Could you show me that again, please? You don't understand at all. And that's the problem. People are too much of a hurry. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, um, and as I said to you, the martial art and the things, some people get the martial and some people get the art, but they don't get martial art. They, they mm-hmm. haven't got talked about before the interview started that the equilibrium, you don't, they don't have that balance. Some people all fight, 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 and some people all tree hugging. Mm-hmm. And both both have a time and both have got a place. So I, I actually wanted, I got into that and wanted to see what that was about, the martial art, anything. Um, the jokes, um, they are, they're extremely bad and they don't work good with time. It's the same jokes and there's a, a film, and why are the films any good or not? Um, it's relevant to the question. It's called An Officer and a Gentleman, and funny enough, it's actually on the television a couple of nights ago. So the start of the film, and then uh, Richard Gere has his rite of passage, and he's sitting at the end of the film, and the start, in the film, the start of the film and the end of the film is the same. Mm-hmm. It just goes back to the start again, and that's what happens in martial arts. You go back to the start. But what happens, you go around in a circle, but when it's just about to link in, you go in a wee bit. You start off with a big circle, and then eventually you've got the minimal circle and you realize, ah, that's what happened to him that all along. Like a good archer, he's aiming for the bullseye all along. He's trying to cut away all this other stuff to get straight into the bullseye. But you can't walk into a shop and buy 40 years worth of experience. No. You, you've got it, you've got to go in. And coincidentally, um, every uh, coach that I've stuck with, shall we say, um, has got three things in common and as I said earlier on like attracts like mm-hmm. okay, I've been very blessed in my life with good coaches and because um, like attracts like and they have a sense of humour they don't take themselves too seriously this is the problem, I'm standing from the class I'm this, I'm that, no I'm the most important person in the building, actually you're not okay? yeah. 
because you know we have to have the balance. Mm. Without the students, there wouldn't be a coach. Without the coach, there wouldn't be students. So you need the balance again. Now, if we're saying who's more important, from my point of view, if I've got 10 students, I'm one there, 10. So 10 is more important than one, so therefore you're important to me. So don't be putting me somewhere in that. So they have yeah. a good sense of humour. Um, I laugh at their jokes because I've heard them all before, because I've heard mine all before. Okay, they're very knowledgeable. Okay, so they don't just say, right, they're probably the first one in the building and the last one out when they were training. And they have uh, faith. So that's the three things that they have. And the coaches that I have today, every single one has got those three things. So that's your physical, your mental, and your spiritual. And that's very important to me. Yeah. And it's like you said, like attracts like. Because I remember when I first started coming, my lesson was at 11 o'clock. So I would land 5 to 11 to be ready. And then I noticed that you had classes before me and you're too distracted to put me out of the room. So I would come in a wee bit earlier and I would get to see. And I used to come in then. By the end, I was coming in half an hour early and writing notes. Everything you were teaching, I was going home. I remember the, the LSD training. Do you remember it? It was like a workout you just did repeatedly for 20 minutes. And I remember watching your guys all do it. The LSD training. <laughs> Long, slow distance. That's what it was. That sounds. Uh, well, again, that that uh, respect where respect's due. That wasn't any of my doing. Um, that was I. I um, discovered that in a bit of research of a guy called Mark Hotmaker. And Mark Hotmaker is uh, wrote quite a few books, and uh, I quite like the stuff that he was doing because he talks about the old uh, burn uncle boxing in the old school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, if someone was asking you, well, you know, what do you want to be known as? Um, personally, I, I want to be known as a modern day traditionalist. Yeah, I remember you saying that a lot. So, um, so I, I got that off him. I liked it. And I went, okay, well, so I don't, I don't take credit for something that's not mine. So that, that was his actually. So it was a, uh, but people had never seen it like that before. Yeah, so, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't the actual exercises because I'd been training at that stage for a few years and it wasn't anything magical. It was the fact that you were doing it and in the class with your guys. It wasn't like you were saying, right guys, do that. I would come in and you were busting yourself with them. And I remember a thing I used to always think when I first started studying was I want to study what I need to study, but I also want to study what the master study, what the mentor study. So I was looking and thinking, if Tom's doing that, then maybe that's something I should be at. And then I would go home that night and write it out on, on my whiteboard and, and then try to do it. And be like, hey, this man's doing this for 20 minutes. I've never done anything repeatedly for 20. You always had wee breaks in martial arts. You do your form for three minutes and then have we seat. But it was the house. You had subtly um, taught me to do more than you were asking without saying, I don't know if that was your intention or whatever, but just the fact that I was being around you and seeing, like you would have done that session, then you did my session, and then you would have one straight after, and you would be like finishing the conversation with me, putting on your gloves to go into your next session. And I was like, this is, if I want to be like this guy, then this is what I need to continue to. It wasn't the case of go and do your hour and go home, is what, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, well, as we said earlier on, you know, are you doing martial arts or are you doing martial arts? Mm -hmm. So if you're doing martial arts, martial arts is a lifestyle. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like people seeing that as conditioning. To me, it wasn't conditioning. It's what you do. You know, yeah. ult the, ultimate, the ultimate aim at the end of the day is your every movement is martial art. Mm -hmm. you know? And as far as I'm concerned, there there's no such thing as one martial art that has everything. No, yeah. no, no one person that has everything. So coaches need coaches. Um, students need coaches. So we all, we all, the sooner that we all realize that we're all in this uh, interdependent web of connection rather than we're all a single entity, the better. Yeah. You know, I don't rely on anybody. Hmm, all right, okay, well, you know, you, actually, you do. We all, when you start getting right down to nitty gritty, up, we all rely on everybody. We all rely on each other. But it's trying to, I'm trying to build that into my students, 
where they realize, you know, we're all in this together, you know, um, so let's, let's do it together. So um, I don't like titles, but if you want to say a, a leader, well, then leaders lead, and leaders lead from the front. So in my whole life, my, my philosophy, rightly or wrongly, was no one is ever going to be able to say to me that um, I can't do that because I'll do it with you. So when you've got we a lot of kids' classes as well now, and you're down doing an exercise, and it's like, what age you? Oh, I'm 17. What age you? Oh, I'm 17. What age you? I'm 17. Right, you're 54. I'm still older than the three is put together, and I'm doing Get on with it. Yeah. Okay. I, think, I think this is the problem. Um, there isn't any characters anymore. <laughs> people are scared. Yeah. People are scared to be a character. You know, this is why this is why it worked for Conor McGregor. Is it? Is it? Why you like him or lose him? He's a character. Yeah. You got to give him that. Like he's a character. Mm-hmm. He, um, he preached the same as Chris Eubank. Like him or lose him. Promoter's dream. Puts bums on seats. Yeah. Half the crowd's there to see him getting beat. Half the crowd's there to see him win. Mm-hmm. Got a full house, and that's. So you're trying to get that, but again, I don't. I'm not saying that's right or it's wrong. Um, whenever I when I did a bit of pro wrestling um, with um, the guys, um, I think the champion say, "Well, I was just coming in, nice, quiet, whatever," and then when I hit the ring, then go. I mean, that was great fun as well. Um, I, a, I was invited to Japan actually to go to into the pro wrestling the tour with them for six months. Not a lot of people know that. Um, I, know that. I, said, I couldn't go, um, and then. Um, there's a guy called Oric Williams. He's passed away now, and uh, he ran a show over in Wales. And what they were doing there was were taking uh, two professional wrestlers, and they were a bit like um, the Ultimate Fighter House, and they were um, going to be trained by these two wrestlers, and then they would compete, and then the two guys who trained them would compete. And they offered me to do that, and um, I said no because. At that time, I was trying to build my academy and I was more concerned about my students and doing what's right for them. So, plus, I mean, going and touring in, in Japan for six months, not really a married man thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, right, but these are opportunities that people sometimes look back on and say, do you regret them? No. Okay, I made yeah. my decision at the time and I stand over it and that's it. I think it's important, like, Something else that you would have taught me is to be just what you're just saying there is once you make the decision, there's nothing you can do about that. When you make the decision and you go with it, you can't go back six months now and go, actually, you know what? I probably should have done X, Y, and Z. I remember when I came back from England, we talked about it. And I think a lot of people miss that. They, they, they wish they had done something, especially in the fitness and martial arts arena. People wish they had started earlier so they don't start at all. And you're thinking, look, you, you can't change your past. You can't go back and change that decision. But you can learn how to live with it and move forward. So the fact that you even had that, because as a young person who used to watch, like grew up watching wrestling, I knew that Japan was the, if you can get to Japan as a wrestler, you're probably going to progress on from there. Uh, on a side note, did you have a wrestling name? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, it was already it was the ultimate warrior but that's quite a good name he was a good wrestler so he was a good wrestler but um my my gimmick should we call it that was the fact that i had shaved head and i came in with the my gloves on and the, the volley judo shorts because i was doing volley judo at that time and the nice rip physique and all the rest of it and um it's a lot harder than what you think um, yeah. it's not, it's, it's not, um, choreographed. It's, um, more scripted, uh, as in who's going to win. But I mean, um, and that's where my Wing Chun, funny enough, my Wing Chun sensitivity really helped me with it. Um, first of all, when you get into the ring, if you don't know how to land and how to fall properly, you're in serious trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, so they say, here's what's going to happen at the start of the fight and here's going to be the outcome. What happens in between? We'll make it up as we go along parts of it, and our parts will rehearse. Yeah. So when someone grabs you in a clinch and they grab your arm like this and they go like that, 
that means they're about to do something. What? You may have an idea, you may not. So you tense up and all of a sudden you get hurt. Yeah. So you have to learn to go with it, which is another thing I like about um, you have to learn to let go with you, you can't bring an ego into the martial arts. Well, and you get a lot of them coming in. And you'll hear me saying these days quite a lot. Don't don't train don't train on your ego. Mm-hmm. Leave your ego at the front door and come in. Because it's training the ego like I've just finished a couple of classes or in the last one was an hour of uh, martial arts flexibility. And I always say to him, don't train on your ego because what you'll do is you'll see me doing something, there's somebody else, oh, you're going, and you're going to be with further and ping, you just put mm-hmm. some. Train your own capacity. And, you know, why are you looking at this person anyway? If you're trying to be the best version of yourself, why are you comparing yourself to the person beside you? If you're trying to be the best version of you, then just get on with you, you have enough to do with getting on with this without worrying about that. Yeah. So, um, and that again, that was through um, BJ Back, uh, who was a wrestler. And uh, my background in uh, Olympic freestyle wrestling was with Master uh, Dave Finlay, who is the father of uh, Dave Fit Finlay of WWE fame. And Dave Fit Finlay, uh, son is actually you now a very prominent wrestler actually in Japan, funny enough. He's Dave as well. They yeah. didn't go too far with the names. Well, there's a funny story about that because whenever Dave, Dave's actually, um, the thing about it is when you're doing that, I was introduced as a shooter. And, yeah. Uh, been a, bit, a bit ignorant at the times. You're like, well, what does that mean? Well, basically it means like, if there's Dr. Al Dickstone, you're not some six foot plus guy who hasn't quite made basketball school and has went to wrestling for a nerd a few moves and whatever he does, he does. And um, you can actually do it. Uh, so all of the, all the Dave Fit Finleys are all shooters. They're, mm-hmm. all, they're all fantastic wrestlers. But um, Dave, the, the youngest of the three of them, um, was with his grand, that's his grand, obviously my coach, in the academy. And Dave, young Dave and I was talking, he's here, I'll tell you what, see when I get married and I have kids, I not be calling my kid Dave, I'll tell you that. And I leaned into his ear and I said, will you tell you something? You ever heard of Shirley Crabtree? He says, I, even if your kid's a girl, you'll be calling it Dave no matter what. Because <laughs> that's, that's the lineage, you know. Yeah. Not, not a lot of people know. It's the same. I've tried to get that lineage as well. Um, uh, my, there's a lineage of uh, Thomas comes down. Oh. Um, stuff. Uh, but more importantly, you would think Thomas know. Um, there's a lineage of Frederick, which is my, my father's name, who sadly passed away. So I'm called Thomas Frederick, okay, and my other son's called Lee Frederick, yeah, and then and my grandson, okay, um, his name is actually Freddie, it's on his birth certificate, it's Freddie. Cool. As, as, our, as our first grandkid, and they asked, we're, he was being called Nigel after his other grandfather, and we're going to call him Thomas as well, and I said no. It would really make my day if you called him Freddie after my father, which would be his great So there is that, and I think that's a thing that, that's missed in the martial arts these days as well, that, you know, finding that person to pass it on to. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit like um, when, when the right student comes along, the right coach will present himself. And then they'll match, and that'll be it. And then off you go with that. Yeah, this is what I mean by this like attracts like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I remember when Dave, I think he was, is he called Dave Jr. or was he just called Dave at the time? Uh, Finley, I was there whenever he was over. Was it uh, at one of the stages? I remember, uh, rest well, I'll call it wrestling with him, but I was like a rag doll, <laughs> and he was just like. What was annoying was he was so gentle with me. And I was yeah. like, I would, I would prefer you be rough, so at least I feel like I'm trying. But he was just like putting me it's down bit, and just. It's a bit like um, Master Jack Munford, my catch as catch can wrestling coach. Um, I never was beat up as nice in my life. And I look up and there's this wee man without being disrespectful. Dave's not a big man either. No. But, you know. Both Dave is um, loving the bits. He's in his 80s now. And he would still, you know, yeah. 
It's a, an interesting story, actually. Um, we had him trained every Saturday, mm -hmm. but also we did a class before he came, and Dave very regimental, and uh, say the class started at 12 o'clock. He'd be standing ready with his gear on 5 to 12 as we were all going on the other class. But this particular day, he was standing there halfway through the first class, like at sort of quarter past 11 or something. What's going on here? What's going on here? Blah, blah, blah. So he... He, he is um, like that where he wants to pass the things down and he would have came at the right time or came earlier like yourself, interested in what you have to do. Um, I remember um, he's uh, another, again, not name dropping, but I'm just paying respect to my coaches. Um, Coach Eric Posen, again, Master Eric. Again, um, Dave, I showed him some stuff. I had me just told him, no, he's, he's, he's... And then... It's kind of ironic, but I do combat submission wrestling, Olympic freestyle wrestling. I do kushti wrestling with Master Paul Whitrod. Okay, and I do catch as catch can wrestling um, with Eric as well. Okay. Um, but anyway, the story goes that um, this is what I mean. At what age it was, pretty, quite old. Anyway, and at the end of one of the Saturday morning classes, I always give Coach a hug, give him a kiss on the top of the head, and see you next week, Coach, every phone you during the week, usual. And um, no, you'll not see me next week. Right, okay. Well, are you busy or what? No, I won't be back. I won't be back. What do you mean? I just walked off. Right. Um, um, my students were watching me and apparently I was like, what? And so of course, first thing you do is turn to your students. What the hell did I know you say to him? We didn't say anything, so coach. The next thing I do, doors open up on my face. Oh, I knew you were only joking. Uh, I wasn't joking at all. I just come back to tell you something. He says, you have everything for me you need. You don't need me anymore. Go and make it your own. Yeah. And have a nice one. And left. And I didn't see him for years upon years. And I thought to myself, that's not the best thing ever happened. No. But actually... But actually it was the best thing ever happened because what he done was it's a bit like a rite of passage again right i've taught you this and taught you this right now make it yours mm -hmm. he just passed it down now make it yours so the only, the only way it's going to get was make it it's a bit like this um situation that we're at the moment with this pandemic i've been telling my students for years and um you were slightly different what I mean by that was, I've been telling people for years, whenever you're shadow boxing, whenever you're doing anything, solo training, we have a four-stage procedure to sparring. One solo, two is partner, three is live, and four is free. But your solo training and your partner, or sorry, your solo training and your free training, your free training is your self-expression of what your coaches have taught you, not a robotic style. Yeah. So you were you were different for whatever reason, I don't know, probably why, you know, would I say, right, I want you to visualize your opponent in front of you. And people just turn to me and go, excuse me, what? And then we're talking X amount of years ago when all this happened the therapy and everything else wasn't big news. Visualize your opponent. So how do you do that? And I, I remember thinking to myself, how do you do what? Just imagine there's a person, oh, look, there's a guy who's the punch. That was a nice cross right to slip. Do you not see it? No? Okay. What? And I used to do a trick where I used to stand at a wall, and the wall was here, and I was spar and I was putting there people and I was shadow boxing this guy here. And people used to stand there and I said, Can I help you? Oh, I didn't want to disturb you with, with this. Were you with someone? And I said, Come here. And then I walked around behind the wall, there was nobody there. Oh, I got a score playing. And I said, That's correct. And that's what shadow boxing or shadow fighting should look like. And uh, you were different because, for whatever reason, you were able to visualize. <laughs> And yeah. it was part of your training. So the point I'm making is in this pandemic run at the moment, it's actually, they have no choice now because I'm like we are now. I do a lot of Zoom classes mm -hmm. and I'm saying to him, visualize the guy in front of you. There's no choice now, they have to. So it's actually accelerated their learning. So it's been, for us, it's been a very, very positive experience. I think that that idea, when you explained it to me, it, it made sense because I was the same as you. I, I didn't ask as many whys before I met you and now um, as knowing you, I have annoyed every instructor I've ever had by the teaching subject and then I go, 
why. Like I remember when I learned hyp hypnotherapy for the first time and we were taught, taught a four part process and I went, why? I'm sure I could just skip part one and part three and do two and four and the same result will happen. So whenever, whenever you were saying you, should, because, yeah. eh? you, should, you should question everything. Yeah, that's why I do. And I, I remember when you said about the visualize the opponent in front of you, I didn't have to ask why because you explained and then that, that's why then when I go into anything that my, my visualization has always been, been pretty strong in general, but because of the why, like I wanted to know why, why am I standing like this? Whenever we did the wooden dummy, for example, after like I, I battered it for years on my own before you said, you don't, this, like when you did the first three movements, I was like, no, that's not the form. That's, and then you asked me to show you what I do. And I did my three and you were like, that's the same thing, but you're trying to smash the dummy and I'm blowing the move. And it, but, that, but that's just going the lack of understanding, as you said, you know, yeah. uh, you know, and people need to understand, I think that's why we said, why? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the wooden dummy, and people don't even realize this, the wooden dummy will give you a certain amount of arm and leg condition. Mm -hmm. But actually, the way I teach the wooden dummy, what the wooden for, it's like a protractor, it rectifies angles. So a protractor yeah. rectifies angles. The wooden dummy will rectify angles of attack. So I'll say to some guy, I can hit this every bit as hard as what you can. And you can hit it every bit as hard as what I can but there's less chance of me hurt myself because I'm attacking it correct. Yeah. And that, 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 that's the difference. You know, you're coming at, at the right angle, you know, and that's what I mean by, you know, I have a philosophy where path of least resistance. So um, the way isn't free, you make it free, but then that's not the path of least resistance. They're trying to make that way free. Why not come in this way at an angle? But that's your fruit work, which has a team in any art. But yeah, Whatever art it is you're doing, okay, people make a thing far too complicated. Mm -hmm. It's an any art, okay. So what you do is you look, you look, there's only, for instance, there's only so much good stuff to go around. So there's going to be similarities, all right? So my, uh, I would say to people, get, a, get yourself a core art and really understand that core art. And if you really understand that core art, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll understand all the rest of them. There's only 10 directions you can go in. So when someone tells me they've got 2,000 kicks in their art, I'm going to say you're talking rubbish. Because, oh, tell me, well, I've got a front kick and a jumping front kick. No, stop. Take a jumping but out. What is it? It's just a variation of a front kick. There's only 10 directions you can go in some. So think about that. No matter what art you're doing, I don't care what it is, you can only be attacked from 10 directions. Do you know what? Now, instead of worrying about all these millions of techniques and things, I'm worrying about 10. So, for instance, what I'd say to guys is, close your eyes and visualize 10. Most people can do that. Like 10 people, 10 trees, 10 whatever. Okay. Now, then, then to make it complicated again, close your eyes and visualize 100. I can't do that. You can visualize 10, can't you? So why not visualize 10 piles of 10 coins? That's 100 to get it back to the tens again. I never thought of that. And that's the problem with simplicity. Okay. I think it was Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate complication. People, because we're adult and we're supposed to have an education, we think we're so, whatever this means, smart. Actually, we're not smart at all. Okay, we need to realize, um, this is why we've been very blessed for grandkids. We get to do it all over again. And yeah. you're seeing them coming up, that's, wow, this is like amazing. And what, what do they do? Why? 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 So that's, and then, then it gets to the point where don't ask me, ask your mom, ask your dad, ask your granddad, ask the cat, ask the dog, ask Aunt, don't ask. Look it up on Google. I've had enough. Okay. But the thing about it is, nowadays, what I answer questions on, I say, I will answer you that question based on my experience of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'll answer it truthfully, which is more important. Okay, so you answer the question truthfully based on experience. If you don't have the experience, that's why you're going to a coach to get the experience. Yeah. And then from that, you're then told right now, you question that 
Okay, that's what it means to me. What does it mean to you? So, for instance, I would say, this is the way that I like to do it. Now, that's misinterpreted into, this is the way you have to do it. That's not what I said. This is what I like to do. And this is not the definitive way of doing it. This is but an example. Now, you find your way. But I want to, like, like I said, I could put you on the conveyor belt here. Bring you off here as a black belt and you'd be brilliant, but you'd be a robot. You couldn't call yourself a martial artist. What's the, and that goes against everything that I believe in. I think we're all very precious, unique individuals. Why do I want to be this person? Yeah, no, I agree. I love the, whenever you explain the 10 directions to me, and I've used that in a lot of my talks and stuff because most people, and I know people listening to this too, will be thinking 10 directions. And they'll do their really quick math and they'll go, I know eight. The compass is eight. Well, where is he getting the other two directions? And then when you go, it's it's up and down. Oh, like it's, it's something so simple. But like you said, we're supposed to be smart. We overlook the simplicity of, well, up and down uh, our directions and then that's it. Like I remember having an experience when I went over to England and people tell me one day that they asked what sort of training I had done and I was saying I was doing a bit of Wing Chun. And they told me that, Oh, Wing Chun shite. And I was like, where, why, or can you elaborate on that? And they were like, no, it's no good. But I knew the art that they did. It was a five, um, five ancestor system. And I said to them, show me the end, the last three moves you do in your form. And they did it. And then I showed the last three moves in the first Wing Chun form, and they're exactly the same. And I'm like, and I, I, the statement that you said it earlier as well is, there's only so much good stuff going to go around. There's only so much the body is actually capable of doing. So why everybody is so argumentative in general about just martial arts? I think like who's what is the best art in the world? What is the best? It's down to the person who trains the art, who practices it, and the mentor that, that they've had. And again, it's why that I was able to connect so well with you because you you knew the physical side of the art, but also the the spiritual side of the art, the mental side of the art, which is, like you say, that's what most people aren't martial artists. They're people who learn techniques or who want to be fighters, but they don't, they don't understand the, like, what are you going to do? Like, whenever I'm, I was going to say whenever I'm your age, but that would have been rude. <laughs> whenever, when I'm slightly older, am I going to min- be able to maintain? If I didn't meet you and I'm still smashing a wooden dummy, like I would have broke eventually something. I'm just lucky nothing got damaged in the meantime. So the fact well, that... What you've got to ask yourself, sorry for interrupting, is this. You know, the physical body, you're going, you're going to be... Um, at some point, you must realize there's always going to be somebody faster, somebody bigger, somebody stronger. At some point, you have to realize that. Maybe some people even realize that at the start. This is why they got into it. Um, I remember one time I was in a private lesson at my house and this guy phoned me up and blah, blah, blah. And he came up and he was about maybe five foot four or something like that. And I was on my front doorstep. My front doorstep was maybe about six or seven inches or whatever. And he went, oh, I'm sorry, you're not what I was expecting. And so I'm awful sorry to disappoint you, son, but what were you expecting? Well, the way you were talking on the phone about softness and using our person's force, I was expecting a wee man, I'm sorry, but... It is what it is. And that's actually that's worked for me because we we're trying to get that idea of, of working our way through. So then what happens is this, and we'll just give a blanket statement here. So we're not saying it happens all the time. So don't be, um, I don't want people misconstruing what I'm saying, but what I'm trying to get across is when you actually realize, oh, this guy's stronger than me. And uh, what you do, you go back to the gym, and you see it all as physical. And you lift some more weight, you do, I've got stronger, go back again. And you're like, this guy's still stronger than me. And you go, yeah. So you go back to the gym again. But you can only go back to the gym so many times. And then you might say, ah, cheat, sure, we'll just leave it at that. You might cheat then. And then you go back to the gym and he's still stronger than you. And you're like, what's going on here? Well, one, as I said earlier on, not sure if they, before the interview or during it, but if you want to be a grappler, Okay, you grapple. The best training for grappling is grappling. There's no substitute yeah. for grappling. I've got friends of mine 
and they can outlift me in the gym. No problem. I couldn't do it last time I was I lift a weight. Um, I had a friend, Mark, and he bench pressed 200 kilo for a laugh. Now, that's serious lifting. Big yeah. power lifting. Um, at that time, I was 100 kilo. I mean, he said, I want to show me grappling. He just thought he was going to come on to the mat. And I threw him about the place like a wet lettuce without bumming and blowing. And he showed me, he just literally picked me up and threw me around. And he, what's wrong here? And he said, I, why are you so strong in the mat? Because I'm a grappler. Yeah. You're, you're, you're gym strong. Right. Plus as well, um, obviously I'm using a lot of Wing Chun in my grappling, the sensitivity training and so on and so forth, which is a product that I'm working on at the moment, actually. We'll come back to that another time. Um, but um, you're using the leverage, you're using this, you're using that, and you're using the sensitivity. But what I was doing was using my mind, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so once you, once you go past the physical, then you go to the mental. And then you go from the mental, you go to the spiritual. Now, the spiritual can be fighting spirit, you're willing to live, okay? So, you know, um, I remember Coach Eric was talking to him. We had some nice chats all the time. And he was saying, and he was doing the shooto in Japan. They talked about this. And they actually trained it, um, the fighting spirit, because it's part of the, you know, the code, shall we say. Yeah. And that, mm-hmm. I, I'm into all that sort of stuff, you know, but say we're on a modern-day traditionalist. What I mean by a traditionalist is I believe in the old traditional values and so on and so forth. Um, trust and integrity and discipline and honour and all this loyalty. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's a more modern, proven, scientific way of achieving the same result quicker and better, then the hell with tradition. Because then you're not really a martial artist. I'll mm-hmm. give you an example. It was something on Facebook. And if you ever see me and my wife, um, we go out for walks every morning. Um, great to get out in the countryside, get the fresh air, take in the scenery, take some pictures, have a chat, put the world to rights. Yep. Never will you ever see my wife walking on the roadside, ever. You'll yeah. always see me on the roadside. And somebody put something up on Facebook recently about, it wasn't to me, it was a picture. And it was like an old man like myself walking beside his wife. Um, but then I showed you another picture. And it was the other way around. And they said, only if you're of a certain age will you get what's wrong with this photograph. Any gentleman is, would never let a female, I'm not being sexist here, by the way. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, and, you know, um, my father, um, as I say, he, if, you know, if I could be half a gentleman, he was, you know, so that's, you know, things like that, that's what I mean by being old school and traditional. Um, but, it was like two or three years ago um, I had a seminar in the academy and uh, Coach Eric was teaching and I was helping him to teach and he came over me, we, we, we taught some stuff and he came over me and he'd have a word with his wife, his tongue. He said, you're talking here about the old school, the old school, the old school. Ah, oh, yeah, he says, look, I need to tell you something and you're not going to like it. What's that? He says, see this old school you're talking about? Most of the people in this building have no clue who you're talking about. And to be honest with you, most of the people in here probably don't even know who I am. They're here because of you. He says, listen to you, tell you something, son. You are the old school now. Mm-hmm. You keep talking about old school. It's great you've got that. He says, but you are the old school now. And I'm like, no, yes, you are the old school now. And it took a while for that to sink in. But you sort of realize, oh, um, don't, I, don't, I don't like it. <laughs> I, I still come to terror. I don't, I don't like it, you know, because you know it's like, in, in, in the Wing Chun system, the Chun Wing Chun system, we teach as you know all all, of, all the other arts that we teach in the academy. We have got a four stage. You've got an apprentice level, an intermediate technician level, advanced technician level, and a skilled practitioner. And all of my senior, why do you not call you? Why, where's the master levels? We don't have master levels. Yeah, and it's kind of ironic. Um, but if you, if you looked up skills and practitioner, probably the word master would come in. Mm-hmm. And then I, I watched through and I, I'm reading now about all these fake Chinese men and then they're not allowed to call themselves master anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, the proof, you know, the proof's in the pudding, you know, my attitude was, was how do you work step on the mat step and the cute step on the street and we'll find out. When I did this, how do you work based on my experience? I know it works. Never let me down. Prove yeah. It. 
Now, it's like one of my young students come in um, one day, is quite irate and not mention any names. You okay? You okay? No, no. I let myself down a bucket full of why did somebody throw a punch at you? What happened? That no, no, it was just all the words. What? What what happened? He's a Christian. And I said to him, Oh, you believe in God and quite ignorant to him, actually, you know, if you don't believe in God, that's fair enough. If you do believe in God, that's fair enough. If you believe in something else, that's fair enough. Whatever you believe in, I wish you all the happiness in the world and I pray that you're, you know, get what you're looking for. Um he said, I couldn't answer the question. I says, what was the question? He says, if you believe in God, prove there is one. And I says, why do you not say, if you believe there is one, prove there isn't one? Yeah. And that's the simplicity of what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah why, why? Go ahead, sorry. It's like, it's like with all, whenever we were, when I first started with martial arts as well, it was always like, how do you know that one works? Has that pro Everything has to be proven to be, to be right, but... If it's your belief system, then I don't see, like, I'm, I'm with you on that. I don't see why you have to disprove or prove your belief system. If you believe in it, it's, like, pointless. Prove it to prove, yeah. prove it, it's a guy, prove it to yourself, uh, and then you start to wise up. You know, you start to realize, my knuckles is getting a bit sore now these days, you know. Yeah. No. Maybe you know, this age is creeping in on you. Um, yes, probably is, um, but people say, have you mellowed? I say, have I mellowed or have I got some realizations and wised up to the fact that why do I have to prove myself to every single person I meet? Yeah. And I used to, you know, falling out with people and doing this. I mean, I got caught up in the perfectionist syndrome a lot of years ago and I nearly shot myself to the nut house and my wife and everybody else along with me. You can't, you can't. So I, I, I'm speaking from experience and it's... So anybody, if I'm going to follow someone or someone's going to coach me, I have a plan, I have a destination, and I want the person that's going to be teaching me to either have reached that destination and come back, or as further yeah. along a path than I am. You know, I don't want some 17 year old life coach. You know, yeah. what the, what's that about? He hasn't even lived his life, and I he went on a weekend course on the internet or something. He's a life coach. Yeah whatever floats your boat, but personally, okay, and I'm not saying that person has to be older than you, what I'm saying is they have to be further along this path that you're traveling. Mm -hmm. so, it has to be experience with what you're talking about. Like whenever, whenever, just if we go back to when you were saying about the guy that landed to your house, when we first spoke on the phone, I thought the same, I was thinking, I'm going to get this wee gentle man who's probably smaller than I am and he's going to be airy fairy about the art because you talked about softness and flow and movement and everything and then when I whenever I I looked you up then before so I, I asked a couple of my friends did anybody want to come with me because it was a, a big drive and I thought it would save me on petrol money if I could bung more people in the car and like that was when I, when I came across your Valley Tudo stuff like the the Brazil when was the Brazil one that was that's uh a long time ago, in another life, 2001. Yeah, so it would have been that one. And then it was Armbar. You beat a Brazilian by Armbar, wasn't that it? Yeah, he was the, there was a place called Bishifi. It was the World Valley Tudo Championship. It was bare knuckle, headbutts, kicks in the groin, soccer kicks. Um, and it was one, one 30 minute round. Most people hate going to the gym for 30 minutes, never mind getting in a cage for. Uh, we were talking about this the other day. It's kind of funny because my wife and I, Rosemary, we, we, um, we just love holiday. We do, we're not really holiday people, but we like a, a night away here and a night away there. Or, um, down the Ennis film, near nearly your neck of the woods, down the Lusty Bay, around that sort of place, or we like that sort of thing, we like walks. But again, it's a very, not monastic, but a very simplistic life that I lead. I don't, this is why, you know, I think this idea of if you never had it, you never miss it. Yeah. So um, the reason I'm bringing that up is because, I mean, when I hit the bridge, I like it. I opened the doors of the plane, I thought that 
the engine was still going, the humidity was just hitting what was wrong, and we arrived, I think it was on the Tuesday, and the fight was on the Saturday. We got this beautiful hotel, and the first thing I wanted to do was, is there a gym somewhere? We're warm. No, it's not a gym. They give us this room, but much bigger than this room at the minute. And I want to hit the pads. I think I did jab, cross, kick, right, jab, cross, right, kick, which is my, that's my mark when I was fighting. And uh, I thought I was going to die. I couldn't even breathe. It was, it was, it was just the humidity. I couldn't breathe. Yeah. And right there and then, um, I was so glad of all the training that I'd done. And um, I said to the guys who was with me, Potty, uh, this is supposed to last 30 minutes. It isn't going anywhere near 30 minutes. So I'm going, uh, he's going down or I'm going down. I'm not sitting out there for 30 minutes. Um, and, I, and I can't remember I can't remember what the thing was, but uh, some say it was a couple of minutes, some say it was five minutes. But it was the local um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructor for Shifu. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go down terribly well, let's put it that way. Uh, it was a bit of an experience for a few a few seconds after the fight was over and I had won. Um, especially going to their own, going to the old bar capital of the world and beating them at their own game was a big thing then. But I mean, it's just that he's news now and it's kind of ironic. You sort of do all of that. And um, on the way home, I remember we stopped off in Portugal, the plane stopped in Portugal and had to get the other connected flight. I had two days to rub together. Yeah. So it wasn't about big money fights or whatever. Yeah. It was just, right, I need to go. Um, and that actually came about because um, in some of your other podcasts, you're talking about, you know, disappointments and stuff like this here. That actually came about after I had challenged Dexter Casey for the British um, title which I lost, but because of that fight, that fight actually got me to receive it. Yeah. So kind of, kind, of, kind of ironic um, because um, this is the way things work out. So as a fighter, it's like, you know, you, you, you just take what's there and you fight. The fight's a fight, isn't it? Whether yeah. It's in Brazil, whether it's in Brazil or whether it's in the middle of Belfast, it's a fight's a fight. Maybe yeah, down to the sport as you know who you're going to be fighting and you can prepare for it. Yeah. But that, that was what, what I thought was mad then because I landed to you and I was like, Look, this guy fought bare knuckle in Brazil and beat the Brazilians at their own game. And then when you put your hands on me, I was like, I can't. You were so light. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't get anywhere near you. But there was no effort. And I remember trying to explain it to my guys down when I was teaching down here in Oma. And it ended up where I just asked you, could I book in the 10 of them to come up? I was like, I kind of I can't get this across to people. They're trying to bowl their way through all of this. And we're going to go and they'd seen photos of me and you. And they were like, we're going to go up and train with this big giant that he's going to overpower us all. And then you do the hands on. And you can't like, it's like, it's like that wee story you used to tell about the bird trying to fly off the palm of the old master. Yeah. Uh, and I was trying to explain that to everyone that it's the, it's not the strength that's going to freak you out. It's going to be how soft, um, like lack of strength. I, I can't even think of how to word it. It was just that, that's probably why I had to book in with you. I could not explain it to the guys that they didn't need force like, forever. You, you've been involved in martial arts for quite a period of your adult life, shall we say? Yeah. yeah. So some people are, you know depending on who you speak to, well, you learn the hard first and then you learn the soft, or yeah. you learn the soft first and then you learn the hard. Either way you do it, you've got to learn both because you don't have balance. Yeah. So you need, we're back to this thing, balance. I keep talking about this thing, balance, but you got to have balance in your life. Yeah. You know, not, and then martial arts supposed to give you that. That's the difference. Like you said, there's a difference between doing martial arts and being a martial artist. That's, for me was became the key when I started to train with you that it was about making it a lifestyle and it's why now like in, in my career dramatically changed from being someone who wanted to be a martial arts coach to public speaking and but I use I use some of the techniques that you taught me to show people that strength can come from anywhere I use the philosophy 
when I'm thinking about my stories and what I'm going to get across to the companies and stuff that I work with, I use martial arts philosophy to, to get it all across. So in my, for me, it was about trying to get it into my life. And that's why like, I continued to train with you. And I, I would have seen you as, yes, a coach and a mentor, but a friend as well. Like I could have just texted you. And when I started to get into public speaking, I would land down in a three-piece suit just on my way home from Belfast just to be in the environment. And people who had never seen me would go, are you, are you lost? I'm like, no, I just want to probably sounds weird now when I think of it, but like, no, I just want to watch seafood. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's what you're saying there. It's, um, I have a guy at the moment who trained with me 25 years ago and he's come back. Yeah. And, um, he, he's, he's some similar and different guys doing different things. But as I said earlier on, you know, it's like you're teaching, but once people get from you what they want, then they can move on. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of problems, a lot of coaches, and a lot of not just martial arts coaches, but like coaches in general, they, they, they get this attachment, and I had it as well, where they take it as a personal insult. Yeah. You know, you, you put all this work into this person, and then they just leave. Um, and you, you do. I had, again, I had to go through it. You, you do take it personal. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, I just go, okay, that person just came in. They've got what they wanted. They go somewhere else. Fine. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's um, from when I was new age, um, I was talking to one of my other uh, coaches as well. You know, um, in the lockdown, I started doing one to ones with a guy in London. Not to do martial arts, but. Um, for my own personal development and stuff like this here. Um, anyways, and um, you know, it's people. It's from as no age. I think this idea of a, uh, you know, I had this idea for a book called "Letting Go of Holding On." I never really knew what that meant. Yeah. And started getting studies and looking at how you're letting go. You know, people hold on to everything. It's like you know, they it's like stress and anxiety and all that sort of kinds like have this rucksack in her back there's a bit of stress put it in the rucksack there's a bit of this there's a bit of that and they and you know take the bloody thing off and set it down let it go but no oh, what they, they want to hold yeah. it on they're mm -hmm. about at the same time they're holding on to it so it's letting go holding on you know so it's like a wonderful story of a, a woman that really sums it up and that's what i mean by martial arts you've got to let go of that holding on let go of that ego why are you holding on yeah. that ego? It's holding you back. You're never going to be able to do this. You know, like you know yourself, the biggest fear surrounding fail, failure is actually the fear of failing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this story goes, this girl, she's going home, but she was late, and she decided to cut to the graveyard. And uh, when she went to the graveyard, she fell down one of the holes. She scrambled and grabbed on the grass to keep herself up. And this that now, and she held on, she held on, she held on, and she shouted out, and no one could hear. It was the middle of the graveyard in the middle of the night, till eventually she had to let go, and she fell one foot. If I don't know an added to let go, yeah. So this is what I mean by experience. Mm -hmm. You're guided, okay, by the experience, so you do know that, so you can't let go. But even at that, people still hold on. It's so yeah. attachment. I think training with you like you were saying there about people get what they want i think some people get what they want and then they move on and forget it but personally when i trained with you i got what i needed not what i wanted so what i originally wanted from you was to become this fighter and then like we learned that i'm the least competitive person you'll ever meet i don't like fighting i don't i'm not a violent person I'm not, not that, that that sort of but you know what i mean it just it just wasn't what I wanted, but the stories and the philosophy and the, the fact that all of your training, like I loved that it was rooted in traditional and I, and I love the fact that you were, like you say, a modern day traditionalist. That's where I saw myself then. And again, it's where I see myself now. It's what I've done. I've, I use martial arts more in my words than I do physically now, but um, that sort of leads me to, because I'm going to round up soon because we're, I'd love to get you back again, so I don't want to make this one too long. But when you're saying, when we're you're, saying, you're the, 
sorry, Brenda, you're the epitome there of what you're just what we just talked about. So it's a proud moment to be able to call your friend and the student or whatever. Because the martial arts is in your in your blood and in your bones now. So, so it's there. So, Everywhere. so that that's that, that's what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, because and what you just said there's the ultimate. You're learning how to fight so you don't have to. And yeah. when people, people don't what people don't understand that. Yeah. Uh, every time I say people say, You're learning how to fight, you don't have to. And say, What's the point in that? And you go, That is the point. Yeah. I don't know. I know. Mean. When I started I thought know. sorry to interrupt you, but when I started I thought learning how to fight so you don't have to meant I would be so good that if anything kicked off, I would just like knock the person out immediately. So it wouldn't be a fight. And then then as you taught me and trained me, I was like, oh, it doesn't mean that. That's not what that means at all. Well, how, how many cliches are there? You know, I, I, I used to be I used to be like, oh, I'll give you an example. Oh, fighting second game of chess, isn't it, Tom? Yeah. And then I'd explain to him what it meant. Now it is people say to me, fighting second game of chess, Tom, is it? And I go, what do you mean by that? Oh, you uh, know what I mean? No, I know what I mean. What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. You're quoting uh, quotes there, trying to make yourself look smart, and you don't even know what it means. Yeah. Oh, best the, the best defense is attack. Why you teach them defense first? Then what? What do you believe? And what do you mean by attack? Uh, uh, you, you just you just randomly quoting things. Yeah. Uh, do a better research, son. In fact, get your t-shirt on, get your gear on, and get in the gym. Do a bit of sweating. In the best, you know what you want to do? You want to have a spring clean your brain. You want to madly clean your brain, blow out the cobwebs. That's what you need to do. People's brain up here, and they're, you know, would you believe, you know, in the amount of people I've spoke to, and you're talking about mental training, and you go, now I'm talking about your brain here. I'm not talking about your mind. What? I'm talking about your brain. I'm not talking about your mind. Is that just the same thing, Tom? And you're like, oh, geez. No, but donkey's years ago, I talked about it, as you know, but now it is, it's great. You can say, so you think your mind and your brain's the same? Well, of course it is. Okay, you've got a phone there? Yes, get that phone. Google, Google me a picture of your brain. No problem, there you go. Right, Google me a picture of your mind. I'll wait. Right. Then, then all of a sudden, the mayor may not have, it's quite frightening for them, the mayor to have a wee week ago and go, oh, all right, I never thought of it that way before. Yeah. Well, what did you think? But then again, did they just accept it? Did they do no research? They That's didn't think. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit like, you know, um, why did you do that? I don't know. I wasn't thinking. Well, of course you weren't, because you were thinking you would have done it. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> this is why, I, I think I said to you before about what I'm trying to teach you is the art of thinking, great thinking. Yeah. And people are like, that doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense to you because you're not prepared to put the work in. But you're prepared to put the work in, it doesn't make more sense. You used to ask the question. I think the the whole thing was just again expanding your mind. One of your questions used to be, it might still be now, was if I flip a ten p in, in the air, what is the likelihood of it being a heads or a tail, or is there any other outcome? And everyone would pick heads or tails, and then you would explain a wee bit more and then you would say, well, what happens if it gets caught between the crack of the mats and it's stuck sideways? And people go, didn't uh, think of I didn't think of that. You know, like that's, that's the whole, to me, that was the whole point. Like as silly as that might seem to some people, just a question or you might be being pedantic or whatever, like the chances of it landing on its edge, but there's still a chance. So well, well, put, it, put it another way. People talk about yin and yang. Yeah. How can, how can two be one? Yeah. Once you put an on there, it becomes plural, becomes two. So yin yang is supposed to be oneness. So you've just said yin and yang. Well, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, it's supposed to be oneness. How can, you, how can there be oneness and you've got two-ness? Yeah. <laughs> See that quote we talked about there? There's not a head and a tail. There's a head yeah. and a tail. On one yeah. coin, there was a head on it. Tail. Where's the? Oh, do you know what I mean, Tom? Don't you? I'm back in the day, I explained. Now, 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 I just go lame. No, I don't. You explain to me now. Yeah, it's great. You know, so instead of them coming to me, they get an explanation. 
you come and ask the question, and I go, what, well, ask yourself the question, what does it mean to you? Go and ask me, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? So I'm in the business of trying to teach people how to think rather than teaching what to think. Yeah. How to think is for yourself. This is what you've done, which is fantastic. I mean, you've went on and helped lots and lots and lots and lots of people. And people may not see it as a martial arts thing, but I've followed what you've done. And I, I'm, I'm not just saying I really like what you're doing. Um, Thank you. Because you're, helping, because you're helping people. At the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people. You've got yeah. to realize people coming into your gym. Everybody, it's a very, very small percentage of people who want to be a fighter. So with us, it's combat, uh, battle test and combat ready. You're left in no uncertain terms. What you're going to do works. Why? Yeah. Speaking from experience, it works. So, but it's also get the, the guy who just wants to get out of the house for an hour and comes down and says, he's never going to be a fighter. He's never going to, but that's what I mean to say you can't fight. And then this, um, we just said earlier on before it happened, you know, um, we'll talk about it again at some point. Um, does Wing Chun work in a real fight? Don't even come near me with that question. You know what I mean? Um, I've been doing so long now, it's never, ever let me down. And I'm in the process of doing a, the Chum Set Combative Curriculum for Wing Chun, the Chum Set Wing Chun Combative Curriculum. And I can tell you something now, okay, after one lesson, in apprentice level one, if you can pass it, okay, people will let know on certain terms. Wow, that's, what is that? That's yeah. Chum Set Wing Chun. You know, so Brilliant. I think when John gets a bad name, you know, but then again, you know, you know, I have another book that I'm going to write as well. It's called Ton the Month, the Man, the Myth, the Art Show. So I'll keep everybody happy here. <laughs> uh, where can we find that book? <laughs> um, oh, I just have the titles of these things. I don't have any. I have a free e-book e coming out soon. So um, it's uh, coming out, hopefully, uh, it's about 95% ready now, so it'll be coming out quite soon. So, Brilliant. And then on, on top of that, there'll be a, a product. The first product will probably be, um, I've got to fill up all the, it's behind me here. You can probably see loads of books and what have you behind me here. You know, you should be studying. You don't have yeah. all physical, you study and do whatever and meditate and, and doing what you're doing. Um, but anyways, um, all, all, it's all laid out. So just kind of in this, pandemic goes over get back into the gym and film it the storyboard and everything's all done just film it right. edit it and get it out there you know what i mean um so i'll get you a copy of that which further backs your um the fact that you're progressing and everything so you're not you never just stayed as a traditionalist you've moved modern day traditionalist so you're even getting into zoom classes and everything like that because at the minute there's you can do all that. Like m most people would have just sat back and waited all of the ground wait till this is over and start again, start afresh. But just like any challenge, you just took it on as another opponent and went, right, how do we, how do we work this out so that it's better for our students? And the family? guy I was talking about earlier on, the, when he talked about I IT and this uh, and other thing, um, one of my students from 20 odd years ago, he's now, a student of one of my affiliate clubs, so it's great the way things come around. And I do coach development training. And we do it over Zoom now. And he came on to we first uh, he was sitting laughing. And I said, What are you laughing at, Stephen? He goes, I can't believe this man who could hardly even spell IT uh, 20 odd years ago is teaching us how to use Zoom. And yeah. I goes, It's great the way things come around, isn't it? Great. It's just but what do you do? You're a martial artist, you adapt, you overcome, and you get on with it. Like I said, it's a, just another opponent. You can lie right. down, and play the head, not really in my genetic makeup. You know, it's, I, yeah. I fight. The old saying, and uh, it's nice, you know, um, it's horrible. At the same time, you know, I come in this world kicking and streaming, covered, out, covered in somebody else's blood, and I have no problem going out the same way. <laughs> that's, that's fight talk, but um, nowadays you don't want to go out that way. You know? <laughs> Uh, so where can everyone find you if they're interested in getting in touch or seeing more of your stuff or um, where's the easiest way to go? If they're interested in trying, it's, uh, you can go to the website, it's uh, jumpsup.co.uk. They can find us on 
the Jumps at Facebook page, or they're more than welcome to come on to my own page. If you're um, into martial arts and photographs and country lanes and <laughs> my grandkids, and <laughs> stuff that goes on like that, there you're in my uh, own personal page, and we have our own, I say, Jumps Up page. Or um, whenever the Academy is open again, as I said earlier on, the Academy never closed the building, did because uh, yeah. we closed the building on the 13th of March. And on the 15th of March, I was teaching Zoom. Brilliant. I'd never even heard of Zoom before <laughs> the 13th of March. And, and then, what's this here? And then, lo and behold, here we are tonight. This is amazing. Yeah. You know, you can, it's, wow. You can, I mean, I was, um, yeah, uh, the weekend or I was doing a, because obviously you're always trying to improve. I had two hour, four two hour sessions on Saturday and Sunday. Yesterday at a, uh, half seven in the morning to half nine, two hour session with one of my coaches. And then I had an eight hour walk, some lunch, and then another two hours with him in the afternoon. Fantastic. Because of this Brilliant. stuff here, wow. Yeah. You know, we're, you don't have to get on a plane. You can just, wow, it's, they're just there right in front of you. It's fantastic, amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we do, you know, as well. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's, for me, the pandemic, you know, obviously it's, it's there, but this experience has uh, enhanced my, you know, my ability coaching. to yeah. coach. Because it's, it's a bit like whenever you're, um, if you're just only, if you're only a one dimensional approach to coaching and one of the students isn't getting it, then that's your beat. So you should use your yeah. martial arts to come in the other way. Mm -hmm. So this is just the same where we can't, you know, teach it physically. But my, my students are like this much away from promotion when we get back to the actual building because I've trained that hard. They can't believe, right. you know, you know, the best comment that a comment that I had was the guy who turned around and said, you know, coach, if you close your eyes, it's for a brain you're actually in the building, the way you can generate the enthusiasm, this, that, and other thing. That's awesome. Of course, I have to listen to my 80s uh, music. That's for me downside. But... <laughs> the 80s had the best music. It, it created the best music, 80s. Definitely. Uh, 80s or 90s trance. I have to listen to that, unfortunately. Um, uh, kind of ironically, you your own leg attracts like and the coaches that I have. Coach Eric, when we went to America to train in the CSW headquarters, we walked in and 80s music was blasting and his jokes, believe it or not, are worse. And I mean worse than mine. <laughs> and I just loved it. I thought I had landed in heaven. This is, I, I, Walter was with me, was just like, oh, I don't believe this. And it was just funny. And um, we Walton thought we he was really getting a break from it. We nearly thought we at one point um we were doing the coach development training and uh, uh, uh this big they, they were calling me big man and there's these ex American linebackers like about this width and about this height and I had had them up on my chest and shut them down and you know, honestly that organization that's uh, we'll talk about that again I because we you gotta go but that's the I sent it to you of one of the best decisions and they accepted it. Yeah. The, the, the family hood and everybody get backing each other up and everybody genuinely wanted everybody to improve. It, it, it's something like I've never experienced before. It's it's, it's fantastic. And everybody comes over, it's it's just whatever, you know, it was him that um, had no interest in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu whatsoever because they said you're wrong. It was free state and all the other free state wrestling and catch, catch can wrestling. And he came to me one day and he said, see that grip strength of yours? What? I'm, but I'm not, I thought he was going to, I'm not trying to be, he said, I know you're not, that's the thing about it. That, you'd be fantastic at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. All right, okay, but I wrestle. Put this gi on and let me see what you can do. So basically I just wrestled in a gi. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think it was a couple of years later, he presented me with my blue belt. Pardon? And then... When I went to a couple of years after that, actually, I was in Rick Young's place, another fantastic uh, coach, really, yeah. really talented, super, super guy. Um, him and I go back a long way. And uh, Are David Eames of Rick he, Young? I, it's, he's, he hasn't changed much. He's, he's, um, he holds, uh, same as we do, coach development, he holds it over there at his academy. And, uh, I was awarded my purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu um, there last Christmas. 
Um, because Tom being Tom, he put all the blue belts, right? Spar, do this, do that. I'm the right, right, go by. Where are you going? I'm going up this end of my, that's all the brown belts, the black belts. Yeah, that's where I want to go. I want to, you got it. What, what's, here's what happens. Yeah. When you move on. Okay. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a word at my purple belt. Um, but still have, still have some of stuff. And then we'll have a laugh about it because, like, right, you do realize now because of you, I had no interest in this, but now you're you want getting it. up to the belts. Now, now that's it. Well, you have to finish the journey now, so to speak. Yeah. You have to get the prepared black belt, you know, but it's not about, it's not, for me, I think, you know, if you go chasing after, we'll leave it at this, if you, if you go chasing after the belt, when you get the belt, that's it. So with that, mm. these days I go chasing after knowledge. Yeah, I'm never going to get knowledge. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I, as always, love our talks, but uh, this one was extra special because it's been a while since we got to catch up. Um, so I will put all the links below for so everyone can find you, and we will definitely do this again. So once again, thank you very much. No, thank you. And as I say, as Billy Connolly says, thank you for listening to my name, Drivel. <laughs> Another genius, shall we say. It was a pleasure, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a fantastic job, helping a lot of people and um, the better their lives and be the best version of themselves. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. so I'll speak to you soon, buddy. Cheers.